Don Pierce, who is uh, in Singapore, back returning, visiting Singapore from his new home in Washington, D.C. Don, great to have you in the studio with us today. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here, actually here, rather than in in my office back in, uh, in D.C. It's well, lovely. you know, we had you on the show, um, you know, a number of times over the years. And uh, talk- it is a real train wreck. Yeah. No. The heat slowly. Mm. And how it's been put forward. Washington, D.C. Don, great to have you in the studio. Kate and I do not. Yeah, both uh, both Max and his sister Kate. Not big BTS fans. No, nor is my daughter. I mean, she likes one or two of their songs, but I don't think she'd say she was a huge fan of them. But where, if you disagree, let us know on Facebook Live, Money FM. And also, I wanted to do, give a shout out before I forget. In the eleven o'clock hour, we will be talking about the Padang mm. and how it's been put forward as a possible UNESCO World heritage site we will talk about that later i want to know your memories what are your memories your favorite memories or just thoughts generally on the padang let us know money fm facebook live page and we will share some of them in the 11 o'clock hour what are some of your favorite memories things that have happened to you or things that you've seen at the padang wide world on money fm 89.3 Well, we are going to indeed go around our wide world this morning and bring in a a longtime friend of ours, supporter of the show, Don Pierce, who is uh, in Singapore, back returning, visiting Singapore from his new home in Washington, D.C. Don, great to have you in the studio with us today. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here, actually here, rather than in in my office back in, uh, in D.C. It's well, lovely. you know, we had you on the show, um, you know, a number of times over the years and uh, talking generally about security issues and, and different things. Now you're working a little bit more on the trade side. Give us an overview of the type of work you're doing in D.C. and, and, and how your career has progressed that way. Well, sure. Well, <clears throat> primarily I'm working as a senior advisor with uh, Torres Trade Advisory, which is a... Uh, I had originally wanted to be the uh, founder of the Hugh Grant uh, PR Society, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's don't been think taken that's going to happen. So, yeah. so luckily, um, um, although there may be a new position opening up soon, <laughs> I suspect they've all been fired. But, but, uh, yeah. but I was hired uh, uh, basically as uh, an adjunct to a law firm called Torres uh, Trade mm. Law, mm. focuses on international trade-related issues. Customs on the inbound side, export controls on the outbound side, and also the uh, the national security issues that are mm. now involved in uh, U.S. trade and in uh, uh, foreign investment. And um, that's an interesting place. An ever-growing uh, challenge, yes. right? Yeah. Especially yeah. for me, since uh, this is something that, well, as a, you know, during my career, I uh, was, as, a, as an investigator, I was primarily doing export control work. And now a lot of that export control related information, a lot of that data is some of the stuff that is going into uh, how the United States regulates uh, the uh, inbound and Hmm. uh, possibly now outbound foreign Hmm. investment. Hmm. Well, let's let's jump in there, Don, for the benefit of our listeners. What kind of investigator were you? Who for? And maybe give us a case or two or an example or two of what you actually did and investigated. Absolutely. So I was a special agent in the Office of Export Enforcement, which is part of the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is in the Commerce Department. Now, I say that now, and you know there are probably many people who say, oh, I remember reading about that in the Wall Street Journal. Um, when I started, we didn't get press coverage anywhere. Mm. Forget about uh, yeah. the, the, the national or international press. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's actually very nice because I used to go to, you know, cocktail parties or to family reunions and explain that I was a special agent with the commerce department. And, um, my brother would say, yeah, he's the guy that looks under the mattress to see if the label that says it's illegal to remove this <laughs> has been removed and people actually bought it. <laughs> so the, uh, nice. <laughs> and the types of cases that I worked, um, I was very lucky. I got to work in uh, the three major facets of uh, the Commerce Department's uh, export enforcement uh, offices, which is uh, I was a street investigator out of the New York field office. Um, I did cases. Uh, the ones that uh, probably the most important cases in my career were against, um, in one case, a, uh, a company called PPG. You may have heard hmm. of them, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass. Okay. And it was for paint. Hmm. Okay. Now, what's interesting <laughs> about this paint is it's the paint you use on a bridge. Okay. 
And it's also the paint you use in the level one area of a nuclear reactor. Oh. Because the paint for both of those should have the same qualities. It stays on the wall, doesn't flake off because you, know, you, yeah. you don't want to have to repaint those areas very often. Sure. And uh, in this case, uh, this paint was being diverted by a uh, Chinese uh, company, uh, the Huaheng Nuclear uh, uh, Construction Company, to the Chasma Nuclear Power Plant in Pakistan. Hmm. And that plant is run by a, an organization called the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, which is on a thing called the Entity List, hmm. which, uh, again, um, 20 years ago, people would have probably said the what list, but uh, people now realize that the Entity List, uh, that's the one that Huawei is on. Hmm. And what does that just clarify for the listeners, the Entity List? So the Entity List is a list of organizations, persons, uh, companies, who are acting in ways that are contrary to the national security or foreign policy objectives of the United States. Right. And it places a license requirement. And normally what it does is it places a license requirement for all items subject to the Export Administration regulations, which is everything from like pens to semiconductors. Mm. And as long as it's made in the United States or meets some uh, requirements for uh, US components uh, inside, right? And uh, there's usually also a presumption of denial placed on those licenses. So in other words, you have to come in here and ask us if you can do this, and most likely we're going to say no. Yeah. So the utility of this list is, in addition to providing the kind of name and shame of putting this list of, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 companies now, mm. um, out for trade organizations and uh, uh, potential clients to see, uh, it also gives us the ability to have a very strict regime against a particular target company or organization without disrupting legitimate trade to the to the rest of that country and or to other similar and, and this where this is where really the the rub is right because right now there's a huge discussion in the US government in Congress about what specifically, can be exported to China, yes. right? Um, they want to make sure that, and Russia, and North Korea, and many other places that are, you know, considered to be uh, risky places to send U.S. specifically technology to. And, uh, but the challenge is how, especially in Asia, right? Many companies do a lot of business with China and with other com countries here. How do you make sure that that the right stuff is able to still pass through the borders or the right investment is still be able to be made. And yet the stuff that the might be perceived as military or whatever doesn't go through. It's, it's a really complex yeah. uh, challenge, is it not? Absolutely. And um, that's why the, uh, the, the U S government has decided to put about 150 investigators on it. Wow. <laughs> so it sounds like a lot. Yeah. Well, oh, ask the FBI. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, there was actually one of my favorite um, uh, uh, comments that I heard from uh, BIS senior management in the last couple of months was, and I believe it was the uh, undersecretary who said he visited the local FBI field office in Boston, and they had as many agents in Boston as he has worldwide oh i see what you're so he, <laughs> they need yes. more they need so, yeah, more and, gotcha okay. and in addition and i i shouldn't uh i shouldn't be so agent centric uh it really is a team effort at bis there are also a cadre of intelligence analysts and policy specialists who mm. all come together to try and um you know square this gigantic circle yeah which is is a challenge now the upside to this is um we have some of the best and the brightest or we they mm. i'm retired almost three yeah. years now and i sure. still consider myself part of the team <laughs> i guess it's kind of like being a marine you're never really a former marine but uh, but old, the old habits die hard. yes and they the organization has grown significantly i know when i came on there were about 90 agents and we 10 that got hired at the same time hmm. for the field offices brought us up to 100 so it is growing I do feel like they need to be significantly plussed up. Mm. Uh, but that being said, luckily, the number of uh, transactions that the Department of Commerce actually reviews is statistically small compared to the number of transactions that are going on. Mm. So if you can focus on the, in some cases, say the top 30 
uh, destinations where things are are being diverted and the top 30 commodities that are uh, uh, being sought by weapons proliferators or for um, for other nefarious purposes. Uh, you can, you know, kind of use use math and science to your advantage. And I think uh, AI is going to eventually um, significantly help in targeting, but um, knowing knowing the U.S. government, it's going to take us a significant amount of time to get that in. Well, let's talk about one of these key products, semiconductors. This is the thing I'm hearing to- spoken about more than ever, particularly in light of what's going on with Russia and China. Uh, you've got EU and U.S. officials saying that Russia is still able to get the chips and the technology required for military use through their various networks, which I'm sure is what your agents are trying to uncover. Where are they going? Who's buying them? Who's selling them? It all seems so nefarious, like something out of a John le Carre novel. How are you currently or how are your former colleagues currently tracking those semiconductor routes if you like and where they end up and are they for commercial use and are they for military use it seems to be such a minefield don it's where do cer- you even start with that it certainly is a minefield and it is certainly complex and one of the places that most agents start is we're not experts on everything mm-hmm. you know i'm not an engineer far from it in fact my dreams of being an astronaut were dashed when I found out you needed to be good at math. <laughs> yeah, was that the only helps. reason, Don? Uh, <laughs> and the eyesight. Yeah. Although I do wear glasses because they say that if you can have your eyesight corrected, um, you can you could still fly, but oh, uh, you Don, can't get the. You've the got surgery. all you've got all the right stuff as far as as far as we're concerned. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> so the um, the the difficulty is number one is getting uh, access to the information that would lead you to uh, to understand whether or not these items are going to where they're supposed to be. So right. when right. I worked out here at the American embassy, my primary role was to do end use verifications, which is where we would come out to the company, take a look at the device. I would sometimes take a picture of it or at least note the serial number and then talk to the, uh, to the company that purchased it about, how they're using it, how they're securing it in some cases, hmm. um, where it, you know, where it's where it's going, what it's doing, is it where it's supposed to be, and is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? And most importantly, did the U.S. exporter tell you that this is sensitive mm-hmm. and tell you that if you do want to re-export this or send it to a new end use or to a new end user, that you might need to get uh, U.S. government approval for that first? Right. So, yeah. so kind of a combination of good cop and bad cop all at once. Yeah. We're talking with Don Pierce, the senior advisor at Tories Trade Advisors. There is um, a, what's been called a web of secret chip deals, allegedly to help U.S. tech flows to Russia. The U.S. wants to extradite a Russian national, says it supplied uh, American-made chips to defense contractors in Russia. Uh, a Bloomberg News story. What, what, do, we, what do we know about about that because it is indicative of many of these types of stories and, and issues that come up. Yes. And uh, in, in many cases, this is second verse, same as the first, uh, very similar cases. When I was out here in, uh, in Singapore, um, only in that case, the end users were in Iran mm. and the end use was for uh, improvised explosive devices in Iraq. Hmm. So this is kind of a pattern. You establish an, an export control uh, for a particular commodity to a particular location or a particular end use, and that doesn't mean that those companies go, oh well, I guess, I guess, I guess now we'll start making tricycles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they want to stay in their in their lane, and especially at a time for Russia where um, munitions are, are are a significant issue. Mm-hmm. So what you do is you find the back doors, you find the companies that are willing to say that they are the end user and import these goods and then re-export them to you. And that's a little trickier now. In fact, um, uh, Turkey has been uh, in the past a, uh, a good transit route for these types of transactions, but they are starting to restrict the re-export of foreign goods from Turkey to, to Russia, mm. principally because they're probably getting pressured and are concerned about what we call secondary sanctions, where if we can't stop them from getting it, we will stop you from sending it. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see in this in this particular case, if we do get the extradition, uh, extraditions are tricky. It requires the uh, the host government to allow the extradition, and it 
can take months, in some mm. cases years. And in export control cases in the past, you know, it's it's been a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, some countries, you know, are are glad to help, and uh, some not so much. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see. And if you, you know, of course, this is all a legal process. Mm. So if he gets a good lawyer, there's a good chance that. It's going back to Russia and wow. not to the United States. So, I mean, listening to you, Don, it is fascinating. So are you alluding to the possibility that the sanctions on Russia ultimately will not have anywhere near the impact we think because they'll always find someone, they'll always set up a front company in a different country to reroute whatever it is they're trying to purchase, in this case, chips to build military hardware. They'll always find a way. Uh, they will always find a way, but it's much like fighting other types of crime. Hmm. You will never be crime free. I remember when I lived here, the taxis had a sign that said, remember, low crime does <laughs> <Yeah>. not mean <laughs> no, no, no crime. crime. Yeah, exactly. It's the same in this. And what this also does is it increases the costs. Hmm. You know, it makes it in some cases prohibitive to use the cutting edge technology. So you need to use the not so cutting edge technology. And uh, anyone following the, uh, the the you know the events in the battlefield uh, in Ukraine will notice that um, the Russian military technology that's being fielded is in some cases the same that their grandparents used in the Soviet <laughs> Union in 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 their training or in their battles. So it'll be interesting to see the the degradation uh, uh, in real time as we watch that conflict uh, continue. The the other and a great example is if you look at um, the the Iranian um, drones, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that that Russia is using in the battlefield. Um, they're also not exactly the greatest technology. Mm. Um, the Iran has been under sanctions for years. There was a a, a moment where it looked like the J, the the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action was going to. Uh, reduce those um, those sanctions, but uh, the Trump administration pulled the United States out of that deal, mm. and the sanctions went right back on. That didn't kill their weapons industry, yeah. yeah, but it certainly makes their weapons industry uh, significantly challenged to get the cutting edge uh, tech, and where they do get the technology from, perhaps say you know unscrupulous uh, uh, vendors selling U.S. technology or um, other countries with, uh, with with a good trade relationship with, uh, with Iran, China, for example, um, they're not going to get the best deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a cost, maybe some service charges mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it and all of these uh, contribute to that uh, death by a thousand cuts right. type of, uh, of scenario. Don, fascinating topic, and uh, wish we had a little more time. You know, maybe we can jump back with you uh, when you get back into the U.S. as well, and and let's keep this going because this idea of this cross-border flows of sensitive technology is is one that's not going away. Um, the U.S. is coming up with some new, uh, some new apparently some new laws and some new things uh, in this next six nine months or so. So maybe we'll get back to you on that. In the meantime, great to have you back with us in the studio. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. It's